Uh, okay. So uh, uh, I'm Gary Bader. I'm a computational biology faculty member at the Donnelly Center across the street. And um, we do a lot of MEPA development work in computational biology. And um, Shamini and, uh, and the Brain um, Single Cell Initiative asked me to speak about future directions for the field. And just as a concluding, um, a concluding session uh, as we end the workshop. And so um, I'm going to just go through some slides that talk about um, uh, some projects that we're, we're thinking about and, and uh, ideas that we're thinking about. Okay, looks like we should, any, anyone else coming back? Should we wait a little bit or, okay. We're good, okay. Okay, so, um, what I wanted to talk about first is this idea called the multi-scale multi human, um, and it doesn't have to be specifically focused on human, but um, I'm part of a program called the CIFAR Multi-Scale Human Program. CIFAR is the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. It's a funding agency that doesn't fund research. It funds pe bringing people together to talk about specific topics, and they have a wide range of topics that um, range from gravity and quantum computing and people apply to get their topics um, uh, supported by CIFAR. They fund the, these programs for five years at a time. Some of the programs have been going for four, for 40 years. And the, the ones that, uh, one that, that's been going on for a long time invented deep learning. Um, actually their office is on this floor of Mars, uh, just around the corner from the elevators. Um, but we have a, a program in th thinking about the topic of the multi-scale human. So the multi-scale human, um, the goal is to understand how the body works from molecules to organs and all the way up to the whole body. And that would hopefully, you know, just uh, have a lot of uh, met, uh, benefits and in, in various different applications. Um, so even though I mentioned we're talking about, I'm talking about the human body, um, I think that the ideas that I'm gonna talk about are relevant for any biological system. So um, a lot of different people uh, and fields wanna understand how the body works. Um, and traditionally these fields have been siloed across scales of spatial scales. So molecular and cell biology has traditionally focused on understanding molecules all the way up to the level of a cell and physiology and medicine has traditionally thought about the whole body and physiological systems. And yes, there was some discussion between those fields, but mostly they operate totally independently. And interestingly, spatial transcriptomics and single cell genomics for the first time provides a lot of information about how tissues work. And so that's actually creating an interesting bridge in the spatial scales between these traditional fields, fields that have traditionally thought about how the body works. And so, um, you know, the CIFAR program is supposed to think about, you know, the future and really uh, next, next generation things. So one of the questions that came out of discussions is, can we develop a unified field that considers how the whole body works across scales? So you won't have molecular biology of the cell and physiology textbooks that don't really overlap uh, too much, but you'll have just how is the body working as a system. So one um, idea is um, that the genome is, uh, that, that actually brings artificial intelligence into the picture, is that the, the genome is the ultimate generative model. And it's not just any AI or machine learning, it's generative model. So people have probably heard of, uh, you've all heard of ChatGPT, that's a generative model, which means that it can generate um, new text from scratch, right? It, even though, you know, um, and the, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how that works, but um, we're, we're, you know, we're thinking maybe um, we can think of the genome as um, parameters in a model that generates the human body. Um, of course, there's an environmental component, but um, if, if the genome provides all the information for generating all the aspects of the human body that we are studying, then any, any type of information that we collect about the human body, it's spatial transcriptomics data or single cell genomics data or MRI images, or even any kind of publication and text that was published that writes about how the human body works. Um, all of that basically information is 
encoded in the genome somehow. Or it's reflected it, uh, from information that's encoded in the genome. And so that means that it should all be correlated somehow. And, um, and so maybe we can use machine learning to combine all the information that we're collecting um, to automatically integrate it and create this multi-scale system that um, can be used to generate, uh, you know, new, say, humans or something virtually. So, um, and, and it doesn't have to be the whole human. It could be a digital twin of the human, uh, like a, 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 a model system that we can use in the computer, but potentially uh, that we can do experiments on. Um, so, you know, is... Is machine, I'll, I'll go into this a little bit more. Is this machine learning, is machine learning a good approach for understanding the human body? So we would argue, I would argue that um, there's a couple of reasons why it is good. So the biological systems in general are the products of evolution and evolution fundamentally operates with two uh, operations, uh, copying and mutating. And copying generates a lot of redundancy because every cell is copied from every other cell um, and mutation generates variation. And that's perfect for machine learning because machine learning needs redundancy to identify patterns. It only can identify patterns if it sees it over and over again. Um, and variation is important if you're trying to predict something from something else, like if you're gonna use regression to predict um, how data measurements uh, predict an outcome, you have to have some variation it doesn't work if it's just a single, you know, the same value over and over again. So, um, so, you know, evolution generates a lot of information that ends up being, uh, you know, a lot of, with a lot of redundancy and a lot of variation, and that's perfect for machine learning. But it doesn't have mechanistic insight, and it doesn't currently have multi-scale thinking. So um, those are things that we will need uh, if we're going to use it. We can't use um, very easily uh, machine learning systems if they're just a black box. We want to understand, um, you know, how the system is working. Um, and rare events, uh, we have a lot of, we have to deal with a lot of rare events, like a rare mutation. If we want to understand how that works, we're going to have to understand the system mechanistically like we traditionally do in biology. Um, genetics is interesting. It can help us link scale. So we know uh, that a mutation causes a change in a protein or a complex in a pathway in a cell and tissue all the way up to the whole body. Um, and um, that linking across scales uh, can help us kind of integrate all this types of information. Um, one of the interesting things I think we'll probably start seeing at some point with spatial transcriptomics is to look at the difference between um, a mutated sample and a control sample. I don't think they're I mean, there's definitely examples of people are looking at disease versus um, versus controls, but uh, to actually understand how an individual mutation affects the like sp the tissue at a spatial transcriptomics level, I don't know if there's any examples of that published, but that would be an interesting um, thing to look at um, to help us understand um, how um, uh, you know the genome is encoding information at the tissue level. Um, so if we can combine this type of information, magnetic insight, machine learning, then we might be able to get some kind of interesting models that, um, uh, that can help us understand the whole human body. Um, there's two parts of what we would need to do. One is mapping and collecting information about the human body. So there's the human cell Alice that collects a lot of information about uh, cells and Increasingly, spatial transcriptomics is, is uh, being produced in, in Atlas projects. Um, and uh, there are a few other projects that are just trying to collect as much information as you can about the human body or any biological system. Um, so that's like mapping or structure. And then the other part would be modeling or function. And this generative model idea um, is useful there because um, if we're trying to uh, understand the function of um, a tissue, it, we need to have some model of it. Of course, we can do that in the lab, but if we have a virtual model, we might be able to do faster experiments um, and the combination of those two things might even be better, uh, faster. So, um, so the, the idea is that we would have some kind of general mo generative models that would be able to generate tissues, let's say, 
we'd have some knowledge about mechanism and we'd have to test that those things are accurate and useful. So we could predict, uh, for instance, a response to perturbation or how, you know, changes at a cell level change the tissue level. Um, so if there's a change that we see in a protein in a cell, how does it change the structures that we see at the tissue level? That's something we don't understand how to, how to do. But if we could combine lots of different types of data and machine learning methods might be able to help us make those types of relation, uh, those types of predictions. Um, and, and as I mentioned, there would be lots of interesting applications like meta digital twin applications. So if you haven't heard of this idea of a digital twin, um, it's pretty popular in engineering, um, also climate modeling. So there are these, you know, the people that are uh, coming up with all these predictions about climate change, they're doing that using very big computer models of the whole earth. And they're simulating all sorts of climate change uh, experiments and they're um, making use of a lot of data that that uh, builds those models. And so they call it a digital twin of the earth and the uh, engineers also have used those a lot and people are trying to introduce those, those types of ideas into medicine that you might get um, in the future uh, measurements made of you as an individual and that parameterizes a, a digital model that um, helps make uh, decisions or predictions based on your personal um, genome or other types of measurements that are made. So um, I want, before I move to the next topic, I'm just going to give you an example of a project that uses spatial transcriptomics in this uh, type of, like kind of part of this type of idea. Or, um, But I wanted to just mention uh, this chat GPT. One of the, um, the, the, the powers of generative AI is that it trains itself. So you don't have to, so traditionally in machine learning, we have to collect a lot of training data and we humans have to collect the training data and you say, okay, this is um, you know, information from two classes and you're gonna train the, the machine learning system to predict the difference between the two classes. But the latest generations of machine learning systems like the ones that underlie ChatGPT don't need that. Uh, you just give it all of the information that you have. Um, in the case of ChatGPT, get it, give it every type, every text document you can find, and it trains itself. So how does it do that? With ChatGPT, they trained it to predict the next word. So if you hide a, a word in a sentence and you give the model the previous words in the sentence, and you say to the model, Try to predict the next word. Now you've hit it, so it doesn't know, but you know what it is. And over time, over the training system with lots and lots of information and lots of these tests, it eventually learns to predict the next word very well. And I didn't have to do anything other than just collect text and ask it to predict the next word. Um, and so that's extremely powerful because um, uh, that's actually one of the reasons why there's so much hype around that type of technology is because um, if you just collect a lot of data, these machine learning systems can figure out a model that is predict predictive. So it can generate not just the next word, but a whole, you know, a whole book. Um, and, uh, and you can have conversations with it. So, you know, if we collect enough data in biology, um, we can use these technologies to self-train and understand um, how things are working, uh, potentially. Um, ideally, we'd, we'd have to test that it's actually it's actually um, capturing what's correct um, and not just generating a kind of a fake picture. But um, it is a powerful technology and it's a big challenge to sort of figure out how to make, it, make, make use of it. So I, I'm gonna uh, talk about one research project that we had with Bo Wang, who's a, a researcher at the Vector Institute here in Toronto and um, students, uh, Ronald Che and, and Quan Pang, um, about uh, using uh, spatial transcriptomics um, to take the HNA images that are associated with spatial transcriptomics and predict spatial gene expression from the image. So we, we most spatial transcriptomics technologies, in this case, we're using Visium. Um, you get the HNA image and the spatial a pattern of gene expression. And Trevor mentioned yesterday morning that people don't really do much with the H&E image. You kind of look at it and make sure that the tissue is not 
messed up in some way. So it's kind of mostly used for quality control, but H&E images are very uh, valuable and, and useful in a lot of different contexts. Um, they're basis for a lot of pathology and decisions made in, in, uh, in the clinic. Um, and so we asked if uh, we could take the image data from the H&E image and predict what, like what the, the spatial pattern of a given gene would be. So, um, so we, we developed a machine learning um, uh, method uh, based on deep learning that takes the H and &E images and splits them up, up into, into little square patches. Um, and each patch is about the size, because this is Visium data, um, it, Visium data is organized into spots. So each um, uh, position on the slide is like a bulk RNA-seq measurement. And you have thousands of those on a slide. So we took the image patch that's associated with the dot um, of uh, uh, the, the transcriptomics measurement at that particular point, and we um, kind of separated those out, out into data points. So um, so we have a bunch of uh, little patches of the H and &E image and corresponding transcriptomes for each patch. And then we fed those into the machine learning system. Machine learning system doesn't know about images and transcriptomics, so we have to convert it to something that the computer understands, which is vectors. And uh, we can do that pretty easily now because um, there's off-the-shelf systems for doing that for images. We use an image encoder that just takes these little images and converts them into vectors, and then we can represent them as a vector space or and visualize that as a UMAP if we wanted to, where the the points would represent image patches and the relationships would represent similarities between the image patches. Um, we can do the same thing with uh, um, these transcriptomes. The way we did this, we actually used uh, Harmony to create an in integrated um, PCA uh, version uh, of the transcriptomes and, and that was our vector-based representation. And then we use something called um, we the, the the deep learning system tried to create a joint representation that aligned those two uh, spaces, the image space and the transcriptome space, using something called contrastive learning, where um, basically if uh, it tries to make sure that um, the image and the um, like if 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 you have two image patches that are near each other, or close to each other, um, uh, and two transcriptome, it it tries to make sure that the the matching patch and, and, and transcriptome spot are close to each other in that uh, joint space. Um, and once you've learned that, um, that sort of happens automatically with the learning algorithm. And once you've learned that, now you can translate between them. So you can, I can give the system a transcriptome and it can generate an image patch, or I could give it an image patch and it can generate a transcriptome. So we um, gave it, um, image patches. We wanted to see how we can go from the H and &E image to the transcriptome. And our method, Ronald called bleep, um, uh, is, is here. Um, so the original, uh, this is a, a liver, a human liver uh, sample that uh, we applied Visium to. And if you zoomed in, you could see lots of thousands of little spots here. Um, this is uh, showing one particular gene, which is CYP3A4. It's a cytochrome P450 gene, I think, in the liver. That's a known marker of, um, of uh, cytochrome, cytochrome, right? So, yeah, okay. Um, and it's it's a marker of a particular uh, liver cells. And um, the, uh, the, the pattern of this gene is, is visible here from the Visium experiment. Um, and this is what we predict with the machine learning system. So it was able to do a good job of predicting the pattern. It's pretty similar. So in general, um, uh, we find some genes that are really, we're able to really predict really well um, the pattern. Uh, we get high scores for those genes. Um, a lot of those are known markers of uh, liver cells. Um, on average, we don't do well for all genes. It's like only 0.2, let's say, out of one uh, performance. Um, it's much better than other methods at the t that were published at the time, but there's a lot of room for improvement here. We only uh, used four Visium samples uh, for this, so presumably with more Visium samples, we'll get better performance. Um, and interestingly, we're not sure if um, 
you know, a pathologist could do the same um, job by just looking at the H and E images and identifying different types of cells by, you know, their shape. And then we just look up what that cell type it, uh, markers are. And if we did that, maybe, we, you know, maybe we'd, we'd be able to do this in some way, but um, we haven't compared that type of thing. So in any case, this is an automated system and it's interesting to see that it's automatically able to um, make these connections. So um, uh, yeah, so this is, you know, one of the uses of spatial transcriptomics data is gonna be people trying to do these things. There's interesting questions that come out, out of this, like um, can, if we train on a lot of spatial transcriptomics data, train systems like this, can we help pathologists get more out of images than they're already getting out of images? Um, so right now they are only looking at morphology, but if you had a model that had lots of spatial transcriptomics relationships between images and transcriptome, could you um, do classification better than a pathologist from an image uh, just based on transcriptome. So that would that would be a cool thing to try. Um, so I wanted to just mention a couple of other things um, that might be interesting. Uh, one is that when we were when we're we're now trying to collect a lot of Visium data and there's a lot of it in Geo. Um, if uh, Normally, we would have to manually go through all of Geo to find the Visium data or, you know, curate it. Um, my uh, Ronald ended up using ChatGPT or GPT to automate the process, so he's able to kind of do it in an afternoon instead of days. Um, and the way that uh, that worked is um, uh, we just asked ChatGPT to take all the metadata and categorize it by disease and other things like that, and it did a pretty good job. Um, so here's the kind of prompts that we used. You're an expert biologist looking at metadata and geo, you know, tell us what kind of cancer it is and, uh, you know, from a list of options, um, and output, if you're unsure, a special number. And then, and then we used this idea of reflection, which is, uh, part of a, a one way of better using things like ChatGPT, um, where we, we ask it to analyze its own response. Um, so, um, you know, it would say something like this, and then we'd say, you know, we would ask it again for, um, to explain why it's answer, why it's giving that answer and what its confidence is, and it would give us more information. Um, one of the, uh, challenges that we faced when we were doing this is that with Visium, at least people are sharing their, uh, H&E images. Um, for the most part, but mostly it's low resolution images. And we found that um, this deep learning system works a lot better if it has high resolution images. So um, only less than a fifth of the Visium data sets were shared with full resolution images. And interestingly, when you use the 10X genomics software, um, it saves TIFF files, uh, the images, and it says full and reduced. And if you look at the full and reduced, they're just and reduced for the purposes of visual, visual, you know, viewing it on a screen. They're not um, actually, it's the full one is not actually the full resolution. The full resolution comes from the microscope and, and has to be like, you have to want to get it to pull it out and put it onto geo. So, um, so we ended up having to email a lot of people to get those images and most many people didn't even have them anymore. So um, uh, public service announcement that I'm saying, you know, that I'm uh, uh, repeating is if you, uh, is that the image data that comes along with spatial transcriptomics is very valuable and high resolution versions of it, it would be great to share. And then we can start thinking about those types of pathology applications that I mentioned um, if we do that. So, so that's all I wanted to mention. And like the big take home message is <laughs> generate as much spatial transcriptomics as, and share it as widely as you can. Um, hopefully this workshop helps you do that and, and helps you achieve your own goals uh, with your own projects to do that. But once it's shared, uh, there's gonna be a lot of interesting additional applications that uh, get enabled um, computationally and experimentally. And um, I think there'll be a lot of interesting uh, ways that to use the data that people hadn't thought about before. So um, it'll be cool to see how that goes. Hopefully that was interesting uh, as, a, as a final feature thing.